It says it right here. Matter and interactions, chapter four, contact interactions. I think it's important to start off, if you're help, trying to review for this chapter, Matter and Interactions, best textbook ever. Trust me on that one. Uh, where where are we right now, right? So there's a couple big things that we did. Of course, we did the momentum principle, uh, which says that the net force on an object is that objects change in momentum with respect to time. Uh, if the time interval is really small, that's a derivative. Um, you know, there's other things about the average velocity, position update, all that stuff. But I really want to talk about forces in this chapter. So if you, I'm just moving my notes here so I can see, I remember what I, to talk about. Where, what forces have we talked about so far? I think these are all the forces, right? So this is the force due to a spring. So K is the spring constant. We'll talk about that in this chapter too. S is the stretch and L hat is a unit vector in the direction of the spring. So that's an equation that we have for the spring force. This is the gravitational force near the surface of the Earth. So we have the mass of the object. G is the local gravitational field. It has the value of this. But the important thing is that we can just calculate that. If I know, if I know the mass, I can calculate the force. This is the better gravitational force between two objects. Mass one, mass two. R is a vector from one object to the other. I mean, it's, it's more complicated, but it's just an equation. You can plug in stuff. You can get that force. And finally, we have down here uh, the Coulomb equation, the Coulomb force. It also has a constant, one over four pi epsilon naught, the, the product of the charges, and again, the distance between them. You can calculate all these things. But a lot of times we have stuff that you can't directly calculate, and these often are contact forces. So let's look at the first contact force and see why it's different. So suppose I have a table and I have a box right there. And it has a mass of, of uh, one kilogram. Well, I know that if it's on the surface of the Earth, then there is a downward gravitational force. I'll call that Fg. And I can even write that as the vector 0, negative 9.8, 0 newtons. Because I, I took one kilogram and I multiplied by this. So let's get that, that equation right there. But if the block is sitting there, then I know delta p is equal to zero. The change in momentum is zero. It has to be, it's just sitting there. If the change in momentum is zero, then the net force has to be zero according to the momentum principle. So that means that there has to be some force pushing up with the value of, uh, let's call this f equals zero, 9.8, zero. So then when I add these two together, I get the zero vector, which is zero, zero, zero newtons. So if I have that as an upward pushing force, that's fine. So we do, we have an upwards pushing force right there. It's the same as that and we call it Fn. And Fn, I put the N, and this is called the normal force. Not because we usually have it. In this case, normal means perpendicular, like from your geometry class, because it's a force that's perpendicular to the surface that pushes up. Okay, that's all fine and everything. But now let's say that I have my finger, that's one finger, two, three, four, and then there's my thumb. That's not a bad finger. I mean, really, for a physicist, right? And I push down with the force of 10 newtons. So, let's see, like that. Uh, let's say, I sh well, I should have done something smaller. So I'm going to call it FP equals uh, the vector zero, negative 10, zero newtons. Sorry for the the messiness. Well, if you've ever pushed down on a block, it doesn't do anything, right? So if it doesn't do anything, the change in momentum is still zero. So the net force still has to be zero. Well, how does this make the net force zero? Because I know that that's pushing up with 9.8, that's down negative 9.8, and that's down with 10. The only answer is that this has to increase. So now I get Fn, the normal force, has to be bigger. It has to be equal to 0, 19.8, 0. So that I have 19.8 is equal to negative 9.8 plus negative 10 in the y direction. And so that changed. So the normal force is going to push up whatever it needs to do to prevent the block from changing momentum down. It's, it's like, I'm there, I'm going to stop this block from going through the table. Now, if I take my finger off and the 
normal force didn't change back to negative 9.8, we'd have a net force pushing up and the block would change momentum upwards. It would launch off the table and that doesn't happen. Okay, so this normal force we see a lot, but it's a very complicated force. These are calculated forces. This normal force is called a force of constraint. Or constraint forces. And because it has no equation, its only equation is do what you need to do to make sure that doesn't go through the table. Now, of course, if I push down with the force of 20 billion point five newtons down, then maybe the table can't provide a normal force that large and it'll break and it will fall through. So there's some breaking point at which it, which it stops. Okay. But the important question is, how does the table know exactly what force to push um, to make this happen? And the answer is deals with uh, our matter model. So we can model a table like this. So here's my table. I'm going to model it as a bunch of atoms, which surprisingly it is, like this. And this is just a simple model. That's good. And all these atoms are connected by springs. They're not really, but they do act like that. And this is a really useful model. And that's one of the reasons that physicists love springs. But now, if I have my block, what's going to happen is it's actually going to bend these springs down. So let's draw, and let's say I'm pushing down on it too. So maybe we have this. So you'll notice that my springs are really messy, but also this is compressed. So my so when I compress a spring, remember F spring is negative K S L hat. This spring right here is compressed. So S, the stretch is a negative number. So the L vector is this way. So this is going to be pushing up. And the more I push down on it, the more those springs compress. So that's how the table knows what force to push because it's not really a table, it's just a spring. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a constraint force, it's a con calculated force. Now, we're not going to do that though because how many atoms are in a table? It's more than, it's more than what I drew, eight. It's more than eight, okay, hint. Okay, 10 to the 24th is, you know, something like that. There's a lot of them in there and we don't want to calculate that many different spring interactions. So that's why we model this as a single force. If you want to, there's a great experiment where you take a table like this and then let's put the table right here. Here's my table with legs. And then you put a little mirror on there. And then I take a laser pointer and I shine it and it reflects off. And then you look at where it hits the wall. And then as you push down on this, the table actually bends. And so the mirror deflects a little bit and then the laser moves to different points. So you can detect deflections in the table, uh, which is caused by this essentially. Okay, so that's the normal force. Now, there's two other contact forces that we're going to use uh, and they involve friction. These are a little bit more complicated, but uh, let's start with kinetic friction. So suppose I have a block and it's moving this way. So its momentum is that way. So it's moving. Well, I know I have a gravitational force pulling down on it. I'll write that as mg. I have the normal force Fn. Uh, and let's say I'm pushing it Fp. You've probably pushed a block at one point in your life. And it moves at a constant momentum, so there has to be some backwards pushing force, and this is the friction force, I'll call it F, F, K. It's the, uh, can, we call this kinetic friction. It's an interaction between these two surfaces. We can model this magnitude. We know it's gonna be uh, pushing parallel to the surface in, in the opposite direction of motion, and we can model this as the friction, the kinetic friction, F, F, K, is equal to the Greek letter mu sub k times fn. 
We call this the coefficient of friction. A kinetic friction. It's just a model, right, that works really well. This says that the harder these two surfaces are pushed together, the greater the frictional force. It doesn't say anything about the speed. And you should be able to see that in real life. If you're pushing a block and you push down on it harder, it's harder to push. If it's a heavier block, well, if you increase the mass, you're going to get a greater normal force too. So it's harder to push. Now, be very careful. This is a very simple situation uh, where everything's flat. Uh, if you have it on an angle, that's not quite true because now the normal force is not up. It's pushing at an angle. So I'm just warning you. I'm not going to go over that problem. I'm just warning you. Uh, then we also have, if the block is not moving, we have a different frictional force. It looks like this. We'll call it friction uh, static. And it's less than or equal to another coefficient, mu sub s. And this is usually between 0 and 1 times fn. And these are magnitudes. The static friction force is static because if I push the block and it doesn't move, it's just like the normal force. It, it provides whatever force it needs to prevent the two surfaces from sliding. And that's the coefficient of friction. These, both of these are different, and they depend on the types of surfaces interacting. Wood with steel, rubber with a concrete, Teflon with Velcro, whatever. Okay. So those are experimental values for the coefficient of friction. Let's look at um, another thing. Suppose I have uh, a wall and a wire, and it's connected to that. And then I pull on this with some force. I'll call it FT. This is the magnitude. doesn't really matter. If you pull on a wire, it does indeed stretch. It's going to stretch. So if this has a length L, and it may stretch this much, and we'll call that delta L. So the amount of stretch in a wire uh, we call the strain. It's going to be the change in length divided by the total length. So if you've ever pulled a wire, a longer wire pulled with the same force, if L is longer, it's going to have a longer stretch, right? Because um, it's like a spring. Uh, and so the longer, the more springs you have in a line, the easier it is to pull. Trust me on this one. Longer wires, when you pull them, stretch more than shorter wires. Well, there's also another property uh, of this we call the stress. And that's going to be equal to the force you're pulling with divided by the, the cross-sectional area right here. So that's going to be A. And this is also true. Thicker wires... Uh, have less stretch, okay, with the same force. And if we combine these two things together, um, and these are just physical properties of a physical wire, right? This depends on the actual length. This depends on the actual area. Then we get uh, what's called Young's modulus. Young's modulus, Y, is equal to the stress divided by the strain. And you may think this is not an engineering class and we, we don't really care. We do care because, well, let me write this as the stress as FT over A and the strain is delta L over L. And then you could write this as FTL over delta L A. But it's usually written this way. I don't know why. But so here's the important thing. The, the amount you pull on it, the length of the wire, the change in length of the wire and the area all depend on particular circumstances of the wire. But Young's modulus only depends on the material. It's a, it's a property of the material. So aluminum will have a different Young's modulus than steel. And that's important because that allows us to explore properties of the material in terms of its interatomic spring constant. Because we can model this uh, wire as a bunch of atoms connected by springs. And so the distance between each atom is the uh, atomic diameter, d. 
which we can find based on the density of the material and the, uh, the atomic mass. From density, and I'm not going to do that problem. I will do it in another video, and atomic mass. And then uh, we also need to know how many springs we have in parallel, right? It doesn't, these springs don't do anything. If I'm pulling it this way, these uh, perpendicular springs don't do anything. But if I add springs together, they make an effective springs constant that's weaker. Because if I pull right here, both of those springs are gonna get stretched at the same amount, but you're gonna get a total stretch that's even more. So it's like the spring constant's weaker. If I add spring constants in parallel like this, if I pull all of them, then they both pull back. So my force is essentially uh, split between all these and they won't stretch as much. So we, if we figure out uh, how many springs we have in parallel based on the area, how many springs we have in a line based on the length, then we can get this and turn it into uh, the properties of the diameter, the atomic diameter and the inner atomic spring constant. And I'm not gonna derive it. I'm just gonna write it down. Uh, it turns out that we can also write Young's modulus like this. It's kind of a big deal. KSI over D. So this is the interatomic spring constant. If we imagine this is made up of a bunch of balls connected by springs, that's the interatomic spring constant, and D is the diameter of the atom. It's kind of a big deal. So we can get, we can measure the actual properties of the string, and from that find out properties of the the material at the atomic level, and that's really what we want to do. Um, and it turns out that uh, this same interatomic spring constant depends on the speed of sound in that material uh, because suppose I hit this side and that sends a compression wave through here uh, then we get and I'm not going to derive this but it's in the book so V sound the velocity of sound in that material is going to be the square root of K S I the interatomic spring constant the mass of the atom times the distance between them or the diameter of the atoms okay that's the biggest part in this, this chapter. Uh, okay, there's two more things. I'm going to do this just because I like it. Um, and we've already looked at a mass on a spring. I did this as a numerical model in class. Uh, so suppose I have a mass on a spring like that. And it's oscillating back and forth and there's no friction. And this is K and this is M. Uh, as I pull it, then the force due to this is in the opposite direction uh, and proportional to the stretch. So let's say this is just, everything's in the x direction. So I'm not gonna use vectors, I'm gonna use scalar notation. I know that F net is dp dt, and this is all in x direction. I'm just making it easier. Right, and the only net force on this is going to be the force in the spring. Let's write this in a simplified way. Trust me, it works out fine otherwise. So let's say that F net is equal to F spring, and I'm going to write that as negative kx. So if it's stretched an amount x, the force is proportional to that. And we could choose a location of x where that is indeed true. Now for this, let's say momentum is mass and velocity. So dp dt is going to be m dv dt because the mass doesn't change. And remember that I can write velocity as dx dt. So if I put all this together, I get the following. The, the net force is negative kx. dp dt is going to be m times the derivative of the velocity, which is the derivative of the position. So this is actually going to be the second derivative of x with respect to time. And that's our differential equation. And we actually can solve this. Uh, you're, this is the, the easiest differential equation you can ever solve. And I'm going to show you uh, that, that there is a solution, not how to get that solution. Because one of the ways to get a solution is just to solve. I want to say what function of x x is a function of time, could I put in here, take the derivative twice and get back the same thing? So let's write this actually as x equals negative, actually, 
the second derivative of x with respect to time is equal to negative k over mx. So what can I take the derivative of twice and get back the same thing with a negative constant? Well, let's guess. And there's multiple solutions, but I'm going to show you one. x is a function of t is a cosine omega t, where a is a constant and omega is a constant. We don't know what they are. So now let's take the first derivative of this, dx dt. If I take the derivative of cosine of omega t, I get negative sine omega t. So I get negative a sine omega t. But I have to use the chain rule. So if I take the derivative of this, I have to take the derivative of the inside. The derivative of omega t is just omega. So the derivative of x with respect to time is negative a omega sine omega t. Now let's do it again. The, deriv the second derivative of x with respect to t, that stuff's just a constant. The derivative of sine is cosine, so I get negative a omega cosine omega t, but then I have to take the derivative of the omega t, so I get omega squared. And you'll notice here that it, I get the same thing. I get the same thing if omega squared is k over m. Now what about a? Uh, a could be anything technically, but it turns out that a is the initial, initial position, x at zero, if it starts from rest. But this is a solution to the mass on the spring. It's kind of a big deal. It's kind of important. Okay, I know that's like, why? how did you go through that so fast? Because I just did. One more thing, buoyancy. I always spell this wrong. Yancy, I think that's it. So it turns out that if you have an object in a fluid, and that could be, let's say it's water, it could be air, it doesn't really matter. So let's say this is water. I don't know if you've been scuba diving before. Uh, by the way, I've been scuba diving a whole bunch. Okay. And it's possible to have something that just doesn't float or sink. Uh, and in that case, I know that I have a downward gravitational force and there should be an upwards buoyancy force also. Hold on one second. Okay, sorry. This, that, that throws me off. Because that has to be something pushing up on it because its net force has to be zero if it stays there. Well, let's, this, let's say this is a, a, an object. And I'm going to replace this object with the same size, same shape with water. And we know that water floats in water. So water has a downward gravitational force, Fg, and it has to have an upwards buoyancy force also equal to Fg for that water. So water floats because of all the water around it that interacts by pushing on it to produce this net upward buoyancy force. If I replace that object with another object of the same size, it has to have the same interactions with water as so the same buoyancy force. So in the end, we get this. The magnitude of the buoyancy force is the mass of the fluid displaced times g. That's the, that's the magnitude. So water floats, so it, this has to be true. If I replace it with another object, it still has to have the same buoyancy. And it turns out that, so you need the volume of this. Um, it, this is true if, if it's small, if you have really large objects, weird things can happen. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's water or air. The same thing happens in air. If I take a, a balloon, let's say it has a volume of one cubic meter, uh, the density of air is 1.2 times 10 to 1.2 uh, kilograms per cubic meter. What am I doing? That phone call messed me up. 1.2 kilograms per cubic meter. So this balloon would have uh, an equivalent mass of fluid of 1.2. I multiply that by 9.8. I get a buoyancy force of, let's say, 10 newtons, which is large, right? But a one cubic meter object is very large too, and it's gonna have a weight greater than one kilogram. Uh, so it's probably gonna sink. So if the buoyancy force is less than the gravitational force, it's gonna accelerate down. If the buoyancy force is greater, it's gonna accelerate up. Okay, there's a whole bunch of cool buoyancy force problems, but uh, really it's just a, an example of a contact force.
But that's chapter four.